So wow, uh, really happy to be here. Um, I, I kind of like the way this program is laid out. I mean, we had Dr. Lucy this morning and Dr. Faricelli this afternoon, and then they told you how to build a watch, how to maintain a watch, how to uh, 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 keep it running smooth, and then you've got me and the practice tips, and we're hoping to tell you what time it is. So that's, uh, that's uh, kind of the way it's going to shake out. So this is my title, but I hope at the end of this talk, uh, whether you're dairy or beef, uh, you'll, you'll be fired up about the future of ET and how both dairy and beef are going to be impacted by the current genomic uh, predictions in dairy. All right? So here's our objectives. We're going to talk about genomic PTAs a little bit. I want you to have a little bit of conversational ability about how genomics works. And then we're going to talk about uh, considerations, uh, how those uh, predictions uh, are going to impact prediction of, uh, production of live calves. And then how does all this information make ET more profitable? And the key word in this is for commercial dairy farmers. People have no interest whatsoever in marketing genetics. They simply want to make a better dairy herd, okay? Or make money, more money from their dairy herd. All right, so that's the key. All right, again, yeah, just to, to give us a little bit of a background, and this is courtesy of, of Paul Van Raden at USDA, how does genomics work? So the way genomics works is we have these, predict, uh, these markers along the chromosomes. We call them uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And basically, you can think of them as like highway signs, you know, uh, mileage markers. As I, if I was driving over to the, I flew from uh, Detroit yesterday and drove with some pouring rain, and my wife called me and see, to see how I was doing driving. She knew we were having some weather. And, and she goes, well, where are you at? And I said, well, you know, uh, I went by uh, 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 one town, but I haven't made it to, to Chelsea yet. Not really sure where I'm at. You know, I haven't been paying attention. And uh, so she kind of knew where I was. If I would have broke down, she would have had a hard time finding me. But if I would have told her, hey, I just went by mile marker 128, well, then she would have known very closely where I'm at. And so that's the same principle we have with these, these markers. We have these markers along the chromosome. And the way uh, that, uh, what that allows us to do is what lets us observe Mendelian uh, inheritance, okay? So here's, as you can see, this, this is chromosome 24 from this Canadian bull called Megastar. And you can see, uh, so I went to school at Virginia Tech, and, and uh, so I, we always tell jokes on West Virginia down there. So this bull was not bred in West Virginia, but you can see that the Aerostar is both the mater, uh, paternal and maternal grandsire of Megastar, okay? Uh, so when he created the sperm, that made this bull, it was in, that meiosis started peeling off that DNA. Only, it only read from the, the chromosome 24 that he got from his sire, okay? But we can see that, that the dam, when she made that egg, it first read from the, the, the genetic material that she got from her dam. And then because we have these cross, so these, these markers, we can see, wow, here's where this, this switched over and it started reading the DNA from her sire, okay? So we can actually watch Mendelian sampling happen with this technology. And you can see that, you know, Aerostar should have supplied 50% uh, uh, of the genetic material for Megastar, right? He should have supplied 50% of the genetic material for Megastar. On average, he did, I'm sure. Uh, and then when we, we have inbreeding, we have the same genes the same, you know, same genes on, on opposite chromosomes, right? Two copies of this exact same gene. That's inbreeding. And uh, this bull should be 25% inbred. You know, he received half of his information uh, from uh, Aerostar, and half the time it would be the same information on both chromosomes. But you can see in this case, we know that bull is 98% inbred at this chromosome. Again, so that's the variation we see. That's Mendelian sampling. You know, it's not exactly 25% uh, on average. We have variation about that. So it's a very powerful tool. 
So how can we use that? Well, the simplest example, the simplest way to, to use that information is to have these genetic defects. We, they estimate all of us carry genetic defects. I know that's hard for veterinarians to, to swallow, that you're not perfect, but uh, they say that all of us carry genetic defects. And so uh, we can trace those genetic defects being inherited, and, and, and we can find uh, these calves uh, where, you know, by, by chance we should have in the population, we should have uh, a calf with two copies of this gene, and if we can't, we must know that's a bad deal to have two copies of that gene. And, and in fact, uh, the USDA, uh, this first started the Dutch, they have very, very good records, and they saw that they were having a decreased conception rate when they mated uh, descendants of Sweet Haven tradition, and they called that uh, Brachyspina. And uh, the USDA started looking, and yeah, they could see that with genomics. They could look through the database, and they, if they couldn't find an animal that had two copies of the, of the gene, we, they would trace it back, and then they found all these genes. Uh, and so a lot of the, uh, in, the in the dairy business, a lot of company, uh, countries have export. Uh, when we try and export semen to them, uh, they have laws that they don't want to import a bull that carries a known genetic defect. So uh, when they started finding all these, they said, well, you know what, maybe we not, better not call them genetic defects. We're just going to call them haplotypes affecting fertility, okay? Haplotypes affecting fertility. If you breed two carriers uh, together 25% uh, of the time, that embryo will inherit both copies of this, of that gene, and it will not live. It will uh, either not, it'll be, it's so, uh, it's so, uh, it's such an important uh, defect that that embryo does not conceive, or if it does conceive, it, it aborts uh, fairly short order. And as you can see, this is an old slide uh, courtesy of Kent Weigel. Uh, we found in brown Swiss, we have BH1 in a fairly high frequency in the population. Uh, Holstein had, uh, at that time, three they found right away, and then Jersey's had one, uh, and now we since added to that. Uh, and here's the original brachyspina, which the USDA puts this information out as HH0. Uh, and you can see uh, these are animals are free. And these are, these are my heifers that uh, I tested. Uh, and uh, you can see I've been blessed with some, that brachyspina is the gift that keeps giving in one of my families. Uh, my wife keeps saying, why do you keep flushing those heifers? And I said, it's better to have one that's worth testing than one that nobody cares about. So uh, we keep making them, and it just hangs right in there with me. So, uh, again, you go back, uh, CVM and BLAD, uh, we get all this information. And the newest one, I don't know how many people have heard about this uh, haplotype for cholesterol deficiency. It's in Holsteins. Uh, these calves are born, they look normal, uh, uh, but they've got two copies of this defect, and they cannot, uh, they have no cholesterol. They cannot make cholesterol. And uh, now, too much cholesterol might be bad for, a, uh, for a, a, a somebody like me, but uh, it, it is one of the basic building blocks of all of our cells, and you cannot live without cholesterol. So uh, these calves are born, uh, homozygous calves. Uh, you'll be feeding them, treating them. You can throw all sorts of dracs at them. There's no limit to the amount of money you can put in these calves, and then they will die. So, uh, it's, and, and, uh, so that's pretty uh, amazing. So we're having more and more information about these defects. That's the easy thing we can get from genomics. Uh, uh, this disease was just, this condition was discovered in 2015, in uh, in um, uh, uh, early in 2015, and by August I knew the results on all my heifers because it just uh, we just find it and give the report. All right, so is that the reason that people so many people are testing with genomics today? Uh, so again, genomics in the dairy industry were kicked off in 2009. You can see the blue is the, the males tested, and, and the, the should be the pink, that sure kind of looks orange there, is the females. And uh, you can see how that's taken off, right? When it first came out, it was, it was $250 to test. Uh, I tested uh, six of my best heifers. Uh, I never forget, my wife got, saw this bill from the Holstein Association for $1,500, and she says, what in the world is going on here? And I told her, oh, honey, that's got to be computer error. Just put that on my desk. I'll call in first thing Monday. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, other than her engagement ring, it was probably the best money I ever spent. So 
but Zoetis came out with a uh, simpler, smaller chip in 2010, and uh, look how that has taken off. Uh, we currently estimate that uh, uh, we're testing about 7% of our Holstein, uh, our, of our dairy replacement heifers today, okay? About 7%, so it's, it's rapidly growing. It's, uh, uh, why are people doing that? Why are people spending this money, uh, 45, $50 to test these heifers, okay? It's not just because of those defects. Well, the beauty thing about genomics is, if we have a, a system of genetic evaluations in place, we can let that computer run and run and run, and it will look at all these 50,000 markers and figure out, wow, what's, what's that marker worth for this trait? If, if this, bull, this bull has that marker, this animal has that marker, what's that, that worth to, to milk production, for example? And, and the computer will run and run and run and solve for that. And, and for this particular marker, uh, again, we just had genetic evaluations in August. In August, uh, they re-estimate the, the, the uh, every three times a year, they re-estimate the value of all those markers. And say that that came out to be, if you had that marker, it was worth $100, 100 pounds of milk, right? And so if you're a calf and you receive two copies of that marker, well, that's you'll give 200 pounds more milk just because you received those, those two markers. Again, that's, that's the key idea here. So that's, what, that's the beauty of genomics. We can let that computer run and run and run. And, it, and the, the, the hard, the expensive part is the digesting of the DNA to, to get the marker information. Once that's done, the computer part is the, is the cheaper part. So uh, we just let that thing run and run and run. And so there's just a tremendous amount of information you get back on these test results. Again, you get the production traits everybody knows about, uh, you get milk protein components, you get the confirmation, the type traits, uh, health and fertility. I'm gonna talk about a few of these traits. And uh, we also get parentage and, and, and uh, inbreeding information and some of these genetic defects. To make it easy, we've got these composite indexes. And this is my favorite one at the minute, uh, it's the USDA's estimate of lifetime profitability. It's net merit dollars. It's their estimate of lifetime profitability. I was in graduate school for a long time. I was poor for a long time, so I like money now, and uh, so I chase that net merit dollars pretty hard. So uh, again, just to show you how this, why to motivate you, why, why to test. You know, why should we test these, these calves? So these are, are uh, uh, 11 calves I made from, uh, it was IDF. There was a, a bull uh, called a snowman. He actually died with the, uh, before his uh, proof came. And so his seam was very, very short supply. And, and uh, uh, I had this cow uh, she, at the time. Again, these values are updated. This is six years ago, right? Uh, I had this cow that was one of our, those original six I tested. And uh, I found uh, the last unit of that bull. Somebody had it, wanted to sell it, it was quite expensive, and I bought it, and we did IVF on it, and it worked great, we got like 10, 12 embryos. And then two weeks later, they found another last unit, and I bought that one too. So, so we, we did the two IVFs, and we got the 11 calves, and, and so let's look at how this turned out for us, okay? So the, the, the bull snowman, 439 net merit dollars, uh, my heifer is, uh, uh, 355. Now, this snowman bull carries one of those haplotypes, HH3, okay? That's, why did I do that? My wife hates it when I use those carrier bulls. And, and look what happened. Uh, uh, we got these calves, six out of the 11 carried that. He pat transmitted, you know, that to over half those calves, right? We look at the inbreeding. He's quite inbred. My cow was very, very low inbreeding. So the parent average in breeding is 7.7%. Now, I knew that they had a, a, a sire in common, so I was gonna get a little bit higher percent in breeding. But look at this. The average in breeding on my heifer, on these calves was 8.3%. But look at the range. I got this calf that's almost 14% inbred. I got this calf that's only 4.3% inbred. So that's what this technology lets us do. It lets us look in and really see what's going on. What, what did these calves inherit? Again, net merit dollars. I had, this is my, one of my best heifers. I bought this very, very expensive bull trying to improve my herd, right? And you can see, yeah, on, the parent average is 397. 
these 11 calves, I've got enough of them. The cat parent average came out very close to that. Uh, uh, the average of those calves came out very close to that. But again, look at that range. In fact, I ended up with three calves that were way higher than Snowman, that bull that I used. Way higher than either parent, right? That's cool. That is, that pays the bills, baby, right there. So we sent him off to the bull stud and sold those two. We're in the money, right? But the tricky part is we ended up with four of them that were worse than our cow we started out with, right? That's Mendelian sampling. We, end, we love it when these calves are way above the parent average, but we also get these calves that are way worse than each, either parent. So that's why we gotta keep testing, all right? Now, was that, uh, were those results, uh, my partner's farm in, in Iowa is not too far from the Palo nuclear power plant, is that the reason we have such spread? Or is this something we see pretty routinely? So uh, again, this is something that, that you will run into out in the field quite a bit. People wonder, do I need to do this? And this is really key point for you folks. Again, because uh, I'm sure you get up in the morning, you say to yourself, how can I make my customers more money with embryo transfer, right? And the way you do that, the beauty about embryo transfer is we take that embryo from this heifer that we really, really like, and we put her, that embryo, in a lower genetic value calf. And the gain is the difference. You know, how much gain we make is the difference in those two animals, right? So that's pretty key to what you guys do every day. How do we make that gain as big as we can? Obviously, we want to choose the right donor, but we also got to choose the right recipient. And, and Dr. Bellicelli showed us how to get her to do her thing and receive that embryo. So again, uh, if we look right here, we've got our traditional net merit dollars. Again, that's a parent average. If you're on official test, if, even if you're not, we can come up, if you're Holstein, if you have a, some information about that calf, we can come up with an estimate of genetic ability for that calf. In this herd, they had full parentage, so we had parent averages for, for net merit dollars. And so what we've done, we've taken these 2,500 heifers and we've put them in the deciles based on their parent average for net merit dollars. And then we went ahead and did the genomic test, okay? If the two measures were the same, all the calves would line up right there. But you can see that they don't, okay? So again, a common thing that we, our, statist, our, our economic models show is a good deal for dairy producers is to cull 20% of their heifers, okay? So let's find the right 20% of our heifers to cull. Again, if we had used the parent average, these are the heifers you would get rid of. And you can see that, you know, we got this box, these two boxes, right, right? But look at that. The heifer, one, four of the heifers we thought were the best group, best heifers we had after we get done testing them, we load them on the bus and ship them down the road. Again, this is after parentage is corrected. In our dairies today, we see about 20% parentage errors. So this is after we've corrected the parentage, okay? Because dairies do vary quite a bit on how accurate they get their parentage. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. We really make a big difference in the heifers we would choose to send down the road that we don't want. On the flip side, 52% uh, of them would have been wrong. For low enough heifers to sell, about half of them would have been right, half would have been wrong. If we're picking heifers to be donors, those are the heifers we would pick, right? Or these are the correct heifers based on our genomic test. And those are the ones we would have used if we would have used parent average. Again, about 36% of them are correct. Big difference. So again, this is a uh, a real, really good way to, to really sort these heifers out accurately so we know what we're doing, trying to make the most money for our, our ET customers. Uh, again, this is called a heat map. Uh, as we get farther and farther away from the, the middle, uh, we change to red. And uh, if we look at, you know, within two greens, uh, about 11% were extremely different, which is out there in the red, okay? All right, here's two concepts that uh, we also forget uh, when we're talking about uh, embryo, about making your customers. How much money are you making your customers when we do embryo transfer? And these are two pretty simple concepts 
but they're really key. Because we are a sire dominated industry, we talk about predicted transmitting abilities. Okay, we've got this bull who's plus 2,000 pounds of milk. He, that means that his genetic ability is such that he's gonna give a random sample of his genes, half of his genes, to these heifers, and they're gonna be 2,000 pounds better than a, if a, the, uh, they were sired by the bull who's zero PTA milk, okay? In other words, a PTA is one half the breeding value. The breeding value is, is both sets of chromosome. He only transmits half of those chromosomes to his offspring. But breeding value is the best predictor of future performance. Therefore, when we're looking at heifers, you know, we don't milk bulls. Well, people like select sires milk bulls, but our, your customers, the dairy farmers, do not milk bulls. And so we forget this, but when we're talking about heifers and PTAs, we're looking at two heifers. We got this heifer that's 2,000 pounds of milk. We got this heifer that's zero. Well, that's still transmitting ability. That's you know, what they're gonna transmit to their daughters. If we're actually gonna milk those two heifers, it's gonna be 4,000 pounds difference on average between them. So that's a big, that's a bigger number, right? That's a bigger number. People forget that, but that's a motivation to do embryo transfer because when you, the, the differences you get are much, are double what you expect, okay? And then this is the second one, that heritability for a trade is a herd parameter. And this is something that, that uh, has been well known in dairy genetics circles for a long time. Uh, but people don't uh, always catch on to it. Uh, again, here's the formula for heritability. In the narrow sense, is additive genetic variation, which is fixed, uh, divided by the sum of these factors plus environmental variation, okay? And what is environmental variation? Well, that's all the bad things that happen. I say, why do I say bad things? You know, uh, just think about seed corn. You know, my, my partner and I, people in Iowa are nuts about corn if you haven't heard that before. They are nuts. They, they want the right variety number. They want to plant it just the right depth, the right soil temperature, the right you know, soil conditions, because they know that every little thing they do wrong, yield, it costs them bushels, right? Every little thing they do wrong costs them bushels. And, and, and if you grew that in a greenhouse, wow. You know, nothing would go wrong probably 400 bushels an acre would be possible. But things happen. Rains are a little bit too head much, too little. And, and same thing with our, with our genetic, uh, with our dairy heifers. We might have this heifer that has all the genetic ability in the world, but if she gets tremendous case of pneumonia, a couple of cases of scours, we're not gonna see how tremendous she is because she is ruined, right? We know that. And, and our producers who do a really good job of taking care of these heifers avoid those environmental insults. And they shrink the environmental impacts. They're like treating their heifers in a greenhouse, right? And so they actually have a higher heritability than herds that don't. So the USDA, when they do their genetic evaluations, they might look at your data and say, wow, this guy, he's not a very good manager at all. His heritability is too low. We gotta adjust his data up. Your data, wow, your heritability is way too high. We've gotta shrink your numbers down because we're gonna put these out to the average. We're gonna put all our PTAs out for the average herd, okay? And so people who get, who are really good managers, they get a lot more response than the, the numbers predict. All the numbers are scaled to the average herd. Here's a quick example of that. We show this again and again. So look at these, this herd. Uh, these heifers are averaging about 30,000 pounds of milk at, for ME. Tremendous herd. Really, really well-managed herd, okay? Here's their genomic prediction for genetic ability. These 812 heifers, they range from minus 1,500 to uh, 2,200 pounds of milk, okay? Uh, so you can see this heifer here. Uh, she didn't give 15,000 pounds of milk. What happened to her is she came in, a couple bad things happened to her, and she went down the road, and that was it. Uh, so again, she had, all, she had all this genetic potential, she didn't live up to it. But on average, you can see the relationship between the two, uh, between the predictions and the actual performance. And it, again, we should get two pounds of milk increase. As I increase my, my GPTA, I should get two poor 
two pounds more milk. But in this herd, because they're, you know, the average Holstein herd in the United States is about 24,000, right? Because this herd is at 30,000, they're getting half again what we promised them. We told them you're going to get two pounds more milk as you increase PTA milk. They're getting 3.2. Make sense? They're much better average. They get a higher heritability than the average herd in the United States. So you are, again, I, when, usually when I'm talking to semen salespeople, I said you should charge this herd half again for their semen because they are going to make it pay a lot more than the average herd. Again, and, and when we do the economics of milk production, uh, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Cows that give more milk, that marginal value of milk from the, uh, you see uh, uh, the idea put forth by Ferguson and Galligan at, at Penn, it's a big, big deal. It, we look at the economics of, of dairy production. So, uh, but there's more than just milk to the whole thing, right? And now, uh, hopefully, many of you here have heard about our genetic valuations for reproductive performance in, in dairy cattle. We call it, uh, the trait we talk, talk about is uh, daughter pregnancy rate. Again, here's our tremendous genetic success story that we've made a, a huge progress uh, uh, for milk yield in the U.S. dairy population. It's a, it's a tremendous success story we should all be proud of. Uh, but for years, we told ourselves that repro traits were lowly heritable, mostly due to management, and we should, we should ignore them, right? Just ignore them. And we didn't have the statistical models to handle, evaluate them anyway. So we just said, okay, we're just going to ignore them. Well, uh, I had an older brother who got married and tried to ignore that and kept dating, and that didn't work out too good either. <laughs> so you can see what happened. You can see what happened is we ignored that. Our reproductive performance from 1960 to 2000 kept going down. And if it wasn't for things like uh, uh, reproductive uh, AIDS, you know, we'd be in a world of hurt. But that's what's really kept us going. And, uh, uh, but we realized that as it was happening. And the uh, computer systems got better. And uh, uh, we added these new traits called productive life, because we saw these dairy cows were not sticking around very long. Uh, we added SMAG cell score, because we saw we we're having more uh, uh, it, mastitis, and then that's where net merit dollars came in, because now we had to weight these different traits together. And then a few years later, we introduced daughter pregnancy rate. Again, so we look back in time, a 1960 cow, uh, she had about a 7% preg rate better than our current cows. Uh, so that's pretty huge. And a lot of people wanted, asked me, is this real, you know, but uh, when I was at Virginia Tech, they had a uh, control line, a long-term selection experiment. And uh, I, I saw those 1970 cows. They kept them unselected from 1970. And when I was in grad school in the 1990s, they ended that experiment because it was just costing them too much money to have those cows around that gave 14,000 pounds of milk. You know, and it, it was real. So that cow was real visual to me. I got a real visual picture of her. But a lot of people don't know about daughter pregnancy rate. Uh, it's amazing to me as I travel the country, uh, even with the AI companies, uh, they don't believe that trade is real. They've been told so long that repro is all management, and, and they just don't believe that it's genetically possible to, uh, to differentiate uh, these heifers for reproductive performance. And again, before I forget, I see a, a lot of you do research. Man, I can't imagine doing a repro study without doing genomic tests on my, on my Holstein heifers. I can't imagine it today. And you'll see why we, as we go through this. Uh, because it's adding a lot of error to your, to your experiments. To have, you've got genetic differences in your heifers. You can do those experiments. Uh, you, you should test them and then block them on that. So again, this is a herd that we would look at. And, and Dr. Baricelli, you know, we look at that herd and say, that's not good enough. 22%, you should do be better than that. We would go through that herd, you know, years past. We would check their, you know, check their uh, shot performance, you know, give them test the herdsman by giving them lists of cows to give shots to and put some fake numbers on there. If they check them all off, ah, now we know the problem, right? Uh, we all sorts of things to figure out with their semen handling. What's going on with this herd that they're at 22% preg rate? You know, that's, that's too low. Uh, and then we test their herd, and uh, we find out it's not a management problem at all. It's the bulls they used uh, years ago. Again, the mass majority of their 7,500 cows were below breed average for DPR. 
and, and their, you know, their AI risks, they, they, they do a pretty good job of getting them uh, bred, uh, but look at the differences in conception rate between these groups. These heifers, they really struggle with these low DPR heifers. Whereas you give them a slightly above average heifer, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And if you give them a heifer that's really good, they're very good managers. They're very good managers. And we see this again and again and again, uh, uh, especially in California with the heat issues. Uh, we see this performance, and, and uh, the semen, I'm kind of, I know all the AI folks, so they give me a hard time. Uh, Mel DeJarnett will probably give me a hard time before he leaves tomorrow. He says, you got to talk to your Zoetis people in California. We can't even sell these bulls that are below zero for DPR, and that's not right. Uh, but this is the data that our people in California see again and again. So these, this is, a, again, these are, this is right from Dairy Comp. Uh, this is just the numbers of heifers, that cows, that should tell you, you know, kind of where we're at for the size of the herd. The blue are the number that are below uh, zero for, for uh, DPR. In the red, there are heifers that are above uh, zero for DPR. Okay, so roughly about the same numbers of animals, about 100, 150 in each group. And this is the percent bred. Again, we look at this and say we wish it was higher, uh, but it's, it's not. It is what it is. Uh, but uh, let's look at this. This is the conception rate, the preg rate that we see in those two groups. How many, how many of you have been checking that herd in, you know, in the end of August and they have 9%? Isn't that a great day when you're checking cows, checking cows, checking cows, and saying open, open, open? I've been there. That sucks. That, your morale, <laughs> it sucks, right? You don't want to spend much on semen when that stuff's going on, right? But look, look at these cows. They hang in there pretty good. And I look at this, and I look at the, uh, the data that Dr. Baricelli shows about putting embryos in. I think, wow, we, could, we might, putting those two technologies together, we might cruise right through this whole summer deal by getting these, the reperformance of the genetic ability up a little bit, and then top it off with some embryos. The steering thing might get easier for us. So that's what's got us so excited about, uh, again, I encourage you, Researchers in the U.S. are doing Holstein research. You know, ask us to help with that experiment by testing the, the heifers involved or the cows involved for their genetic ability for DPR. All right. We also have heifer conception rate as a trait. Not many people know we have that trait available. Uh, and and uh, it's surprising that uh, here I show this to my Holstein breeders because uh, uh, the Holstein heifer is actually the most fertile heifer we have. Uh, people think that Jersey heifer is the most fertile. One guy told me all he does is get his Jersey heifers uh, pregnant is put a little semen in the fly sprayer at night. But it's kind of a myth. It's kind of a myth. It, you know, they're not as fertile as our Holstein heifers. Uh, Holst Jersey cow is a completely different animal. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the tremendous amount of milk that this is, a, these are differences relative to Holstein. So the Jersey cow gives uh, 5,300 pounds less milk. Uh, that Holstein cow is really metabolizing a lot of progesterone. Totally different beast than a Holstein heifer. She's actually pretty fertile as a heifer. But again, we see differences in, in these heifers for how they perform uh, uh, for AI. Uh, and I've got it on my list, uh, and I've promised uh, Dr. James here, uh, uh, promised uh, uh, him that I will get this in a newsletter at some point, but I've got some data together to look at how does this translate to to ET performance, recipient performance, because it is a different beast, right? I mean, that, that's the, the nice thing about ET is you are checking for a good CL and things like that. Will we help these low deep uh, heifer conception rate or, co or DPR cows by having you come in and check for a good CL uh, and, and really help uh, get those cows going? That's My partner really likes ET for that in his cows because uh, he really picks up days open. We still have 20% of our cows that don't want to cycle, and we find them earlier because we're using them as recipients, and we get them restarted rather than bringing them with time to AI and waiting. I assume with your talk, you, that's why you, you check for a CL. That's why you don't, with your time, I see, see fixed timed it's, uh, ET, but it's not. It's, it's for those that have a good CL. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Again, uh, this is a trait that not many people know about, and, and uh, we don't talk about it a lot, uh, but uh, daughter stillbirths. We have a problem in Holsteins, particularly Holstein virgin heifers, where they want to have a dead calf. And uh, 
that uh, uh, has been it, that was increasing over time. And as we exported semen across the pond and elsewhere, uh, they saw this Holstein heifer and they said, wow, she is big and beautiful and she gives a tremendous amount of milk, but what's with the dead calves? And, and so we had, we had to realize uh, we have a problem and we started genetic evaluation. And again, it's a, just like a beef trait, uh, there's two factors. Uh, you'd have sire stillbirth. Again, so if you're using a bull as a service sire to breed a cow, uh, what percent of those calves were born dead because he's the service sire? And then this is the big one, daughter stillbirth. Uh, it, when that daughter of that bull great, uh, grows up, wh what percent of the time will she have a dead calf just because she's out of that bull? Again, you can see the heritabilities of these traits. It's lower for, for sire stillbirth versus daughter stillbirth. And uh, again, this is a, we are a male AI dominated industry. So these were created to evaluate bulls. And so when we started genomics, we have an animal model. So the heifers got predictions as well. And when we started that, we didn't know which one to look at. Uh, we, people would ask us, what do we look at on this? Is it relevant? Are these two traits even relevant when we're looking at heifers? And so we got some data together on that. So this is a, 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 a 4,110 heifers. They were all tested, uh, genomically tested. And when you get your stillbirth evaluations, and I'm, I apologize, I skipped over that. Uh, uh, you can see our Holstein heifers are running about 12% 12, uh, 12 dead calves on average. Here's our Holstein cows in the blue. They're about the same as a Jersey cow, Jersey bull. Not as good as our Angus cows, probably, right? For having dead calves. She, she has about 5% dead calves. Probably a lot of those twins, too. Uh, but so what they did is nobody likes highlighting the, these numbers, right? These are, that's bad. 12% dead is bad, right? So what they said is, well, they only have one calf up here. And they have two calves down here as cows. So you take the weighted average of that, that's 8%. That's not so bad, right? So that's what we're going to say. She's going to have 8% dead calves over her lifetime. And so that's kind of the base for our predictions uh, when we get them back. And they come back as a, as a number, 8.2, 8.5, 9 9.3. So what I did on this is here we have 769 heifers. And these heifers, when they were tested as they left the hutch at this dairy, and I kept that first evaluation uh, in our database. And uh, 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 I took all the heifers between 8.0 and 8.9, and I said, you're an eight, okay? So we had 769 of those heifers. And when we followed them, 85 of them had a dead calf in this herd. So that's right at 11% dead calves. You follow what I'm looking at there? And you can see that you know, we've got you know, more in these. And you know, so we're wondering, do these predictions work? And uh, yeah, it looks like it's working real nice. Again, these are predicted transmitting abilities. And it looks like as I increase my PTA for Dar Stillbirth by one, I get 2% more dead calves. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? I'm thinking, well, that's pretty good. It's working really well. And this, I show this is, this is why I looked at my SAS output as I was doing this analysis. And uh, I saw this and I thought, oh, this is looking pretty good. And then I, you might look at that and say, well, I got 312 heifers here. I wonder if they had any that were higher than nine. And then I hit the page down button on my output. Because it kind of looked like it was doing that a little bit. I hit the page down button and yep, they had some tens. They had 70 of those heifers and 16 of them had a dead calf. That's a 22% clip. And then they had 11 of these heifers, uh, uh, 14 of these heifers came back as 11. And six of them had a dead calf. That's 40 some percent dead calves. And they had one heifer that was a 12, and she had a live calf, presumably just to piss me off. But <laughs> I stood up and I said, Holy shit, wow. And I thought back a few years ago, I decided to get into jerseys. And, and uh, I heard that I, uh, I found a herd that had uh, some really good jerseys, some so so Holsteins. And we transferred a whole bunch of jersey embryos into those so so Holstein heifers, and we made a pile. I mean, a pile of the cutest, deadest little brown calves you ever saw. <laughs> About 15% of them. And I was looking at my, my ET vet, and I was like, wow, what part, did he graduate in the top half of his class, or what's going on here? And then I saw this data, and I said, wow, I did that to myself, didn't I? Yeah, that's pretty good. Good one, Weigel. 
So uh, that's cool. So you might want to look at that because this has been very, very repeatable. I go to farm after farm after farm. In fact, it's got to be a point where you know, we look at this herd and we would go to them and say, look, you know, these heifers should be having live calves. You know, you need to manage, you probably need to look at your maternity pen a little bit because these heifers in, in most of our herds are having really, they're just as good as beef cow. They're having live calves like you're supposed to, right? And if you're not, then we know it's a management problem, right? We've got the genetic ability and they're not matching up. But it's been very, very repeatable. And again, when calves were 500 bucks a piece, people pay attention to that. That was pretty neat. So, so again, think about choosing that recipient. Maybe the lowest net merit heifer isn't the best recipient heifer if you want to make your, uh, money for your customers. All right. Uh, again, so we look at all these different traits. We wrap them up into net merit dollars, which is our estimate of lifetime profitability. And, and uh, 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 this is where we really want to talk to our commercial dairy farmers about ET, okay? Because uh, you look at, here's our 2012 heifers in this la large herd. These are actual data from a, from a herd, the number of animals in this. So he had 300 and some heifers that came back at 400 $450. And, and, and so you can see that distribution. Uh, and, and then his 2013 heifers are better. And, and he's, this herd is doing a tremendous amount of ET. Again, our average herd in the United States is estimated to make him up $35 a, a year progress. You know, they're doing almost triple that because of the embryo transfer, right? That's tremendous. That's tremendous. But yet, he's, they still have all this genetic variation. And so, our models uh, and everything we look at uh, uh, say we should be doing, uh, uh, making 20% extra heifers, 15 to 20%. Uh, call, we like to make 20%, call 15% of them right away as calves. And that really moves the average. If you take that long distribution there, that big you know, tail, and you chop that off, that really moves the average up quite a bit. And that's what our, we're looking at for, for our our dairy herds to do pretty routinely. Make extra heifers, get rid of that bottom end of those heifers. And, and then we can talk, so now here's the catch, right? So once we get rid of that bottom 20%, now we've got kind of good heifers left. Now do you want to put an embryo in them? And that's what we're, so that's something for you to think about as we uh, go forward here. This is another thing that we want to talk about. Um, let me skip, let me, I'm going to change the order on these two just a little bit. Uh, this is a herd, I, I, this is a graph I run for a lot of different herds. Okay, so here's parity down here. Here's actual milk production. And I always tell people when I run this that, you know, the processors in Iowa are really tough. Uh, they, they're just jerks. They don't pay on mature equivalent milk yield. They only pay what goes in that semi when it leaves the driveway, right? They don't pay on ME. Uh, and so uh, people like to look at mature equivalent milk. But this is actual milk. Again, this is a tremendous herd. Their heifers are given 87 pounds a day. That's a tremendous herd, right? But look at their mature cows. They're a little bit different than the average. In the average herd, the mature cow gives 25% more milk than a, than a, than a two-year-old, right? 25% more milk. That's a lot. That is a lot more milk. And yet, uh, probably not much different if we look at the weaning weights on calves, would it look pretty similar by lactation? You know, older cows give more milk. In our average beef herd, people recognize those, you know, it's expensive to keep that replacement heifer. She doesn't produce as well. And so how, what percent two-year-olds will we have? 20%, right? In our dairy herds, with the magic of sex semen and keeping your calves alive, you could easily keep 50%, you have 50% two-year-olds, very easily. It's amazing. I go to herds pretty routinely, and they'll tell me, I don't know about this uh, genetic progress. I'm shipping less milk than I was two years ago. And then we look at their percent of their herd that's made up of two-year-olds, and it keeps going up. They're not managing that process at all. They're saying, wow, we've got 100 springers. Let's go cull 100 cows somewhere. Okay, and this, this, is the, this herd is at 41%, two-year-olds in the herd today. That means their cull rate must be closer to 50%, right? They must be turning over about 50% of their cows every, every year. 
and yet they've got that productivity curve. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so we really want to push people to, to, to look at the beef herds. They're right. A 20% 20, 20 cull rate is very achievable. We're, we're telling them 30, you know, Cornell says 35% cull rate. Uh, again, we've got to get this cull rate down. One of the problems with older cows and Holsteins is twins. And here's the, the incidence of uh, what I did for this is very unscientific. I took the last five backups I got from dairies, dairy herd that I knew were not doing any embryo transfer. And I, I looked at the frequency of twins by parity in those five herds. So this is surprising. I always think of two-year-olds having very, very low incidence of twins. But I'm consistently seeing about 1% twins in, in first lactation heifers today. And again, it, it jumps up for second parity. It jumps up. This herd has got, you know, 18% uh, twins. Wow. What's a set of twins cost the producer? They give less milk when they're carrying them. Woody Hayes, like many from Ohio State, his logic on the forward pass wasn't so good, you know, isn't applying that logic. But on dairy farms, you know, the outcomes on twins are bad. You know, you have mixed twins, you have, and the cow is, you know, most of our stillbirths come from, in mature cows, come from twins. And the vet expenses, the death loss, this is a big deal. In fact, this herd right here is aborting almost all their twins, okay? They recognize the huge economic in impact of twins. Why am, I, why am I harping on this? When you're thinking about doing embryo transfer, it's pretty magical. You put one embryo in, nine months later, how many calves come out? My partner loves that shit. He is all over that. And, and uh, cause he figures it's 500 bucks every time he has a set of twins between the lost production the headaches, and all the treatments. So you do the math on that. If you've got 12% twins, you can pay for a lot of your part of your ET bill by getting rid of that twin thing. Do the math on it for your customers. I really encourage you. All, everything's pointing to that we're going to, these cows are making money. They make 25% more milk than your, than your heifers. They're behind genetically. Do you really want to, you know, is she, is, are these fourth calf heifers, cows likely to, to leave you a heifer that you're going to keep? They're behind. They're behind genetically, but they're making money today. Let's put an embryo in them. And that's why I mentioned the beef folks to you. Uh, to you. We've got a lot of people who are looking at these, we're doing sex semen on these high-end genetic heifers. We're doing some embryo transfer with sex semen. And they're putting a lot of beef semen in these cows. And they're getting $75, $100 extra for that crossbred beef calf, right? What if we could put a, an embryo, a beef embryo in that cow instead and get a full blood, a real full blood beef calf? What would that calf be worth? I think there's, there's no doubt in my mind that's where we're heading as an industry, in the dairy industry, that we're absolutely going to use more and more embryo transfer and we're going to be putting in, uh, beef embryos in these cows. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind. So again, just give you all something to think about. We're seeing tremendous uptake in, in, uh, in our large uh, dairies with uh, embryo transfer today. I'm really jacked up to see all you young folks out in the audience because I think it's a big deal going forward. All right? Any questions on this up to this point about what I've covered? Kind of a natural break in my Yes, sir. Are you saying that uh, the PCR is doing not just a big calf thing, but it's something else? Da daughter stillbirth? Correct. Yes, sir. And people, uh, the question is, is daughter stillbirth just a big calf syndrome? And it is not. Uh, you know, and those Jersey calves, uh, uh, that's, that's why I mentioned that, because they spit those out like they just coughed and those Jersey calves fell out of them. But uh, those, you reach into those heifers and that calf is dead. Uh, and and uh, I think I've talked to some folks on the East Coast who are, who are inducing those heifers and they're getting, more, uh, they're getting more live calves. But yeah, you know, inducing, that, then you bring in a whole nut, you know, bunch more issues, uh, retained placenta, things like that.
Yes, sir. The question is, were there particular bloodlines of Holsteins that were causing uh, Yeah, Bel if you're if you're a, he mentioned Bellwood Marshall, I think if I remember correctly, and there's a little bit of a split too. Uh, if you're a bull calf born to a virgin heifer, Holstein heifer, your chances are, are worse than a heifer calf, and people have noticed that. I think if you're a bull calf born to a first calf virgin uh, uh, daughter of, of Bellwood Marshall, you had about a 40% chance of dying. It was pretty bad. It was dramatic. Yeah. So he was he gets blamed for it. But he wasn't alone. He was, you know, there's other bulls in the breed that were a real problem, and uh, it, it, that's why I go to some herds. It's, it's, it's really easy to show them that result. I mean, it's really easy to show them that result in, in all the herds I go to, but some it's, it's like, wow, uh, it blows them away uh, how bad they are. Okay. Um, the reason I've made that spot here is, you know, here's where I, uh, I guess I got a sell from yet here too, you know. So, clarify plus. <laughs> But it does have relevance to you as well. So we've been working very hard. We're not just a genomics lab. We also do research. And uh, we, we came out with Clarified Plus. Again, so in our, in our evaluations, we have the full CDCB evaluations, which I talked about before, uh, all, the, all the good stuff we have. And we've added to that uh, today uh, uh, evaluations for mastitis, lameness, metritis, retained placenta, DA, and ketosis. Uh, again, we're also adding in polled. Uh, as we talk to uh, travel the country, you know, uh, more and more of these large herds have relationships with process, uh, processors and they want polled calves. Uh, it's not good enough to say we, we don't want uh, polled, they want it. So, uh, again, we came up with a couple indexes to put all this together, uh, kind of a net merit blended with these new traits. Again, uh, do, these, do these predictions work? Uh, we, w the way we express these traits is, uh, is the average is 100 and the standard deviation is 5. And so again, this is a, uh, 1,292 heifers that, th that were not in our database or not in our evaluations. Uh, their data is not in our evaluations and, and we upgraded them with these herds and upgraded these heifers. Uh, they're outside the system, they're phenotypes. And then we tested what percent of them had these, uh, had these diseases. So these heifers here, uh, right here. Uh, they would be the heifers that are 105, 106, 107. For, uh, I just kind of grouped them together. There was 109 of those heifers, and 13, per, 13 of them heifers had metritis. Okay? You go over here, and 7 out of 18 heifers had metritis. Okay? So the predictions are work. Uh, how many of you have uh, been around a really good case of metritis lately? You know, I could live my whole life and not smell another case of metritis, and I'd just be fine. I'm convinced of it. So, uh, you know, we put an economic value on this value on this trait. Uh, again, we know what it does to repro. It's a killer. A surprising number of heifers die from metritis. Um, uh, but we only look at economics here. We're not looking at the quality of life of, of uh, improvements, right? Uh, to me, that's as I get older. Uh, my partner says uh, the labor situation is tougher and tougher on our dairies. Uh, nobody likes, he has, doesn't have people lining up the dairy to work, but he sure doesn't have people lining up to treat metritis. He knows that. And uh, so what's the value of that trait as we go forward? Um, pretty dramatic differences uh, uh, as we go look at these things. Again, we got our selection indexes. So basically, we, 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 there's traits in net merit, productive life, and DPR. And semantic cell, it's amazing how these traits are all kind of related a little bit. Uh, we're learning more and more about that. Uh, so we had to incorporate these new traits and not double account for these, uh, for these diseases uh, and the relationships. And this is the kind of wellness trait dollars is the one we have for the value of the, of the six traits we look at. Again, this is another herd that uh, uh, had 420 heifers. They decide to test whether this was working on their herd. Again, so the data's not in our system. Uh, the, the predictions are clean. And uh, this is one of our veterinarians, Dr. Kirkpatrick, did this analysis in Dairy Comp. And he, he broke these out a little bit different. He said, one of my best 10% of the heifers for, for uh, wellness trait dollars, which is our, our, our index, and, and the worst 10% for wellness trait dollars, and uh, uh, um, what percent of these heifers had an event, you know, got treated for mastitis, metritis, metritis lameness, DA, uh, and again, he's, then he's got the mill groups there. 
and uh, here's the actual numbers. So again, in this group, uh, again, a heifer might have been treated for multiple cases. I always love those heifers that, you know, freshen in with metritis and RP, and then they have a DA. That's always the great to get that hat trick going. Uh, so there, there could be, you know, heifers have multiple events, but again, among these 40 heifers, uh, there would be an average of 0.25 events, okay? Among these 42 heifers, there would be an average of 0.86 events, okay? So imagine you're calving in 100 heifers in each group. These types of heifers, you gotta treat 86 of them. These heifers here, you gotta treat 25 of them. That's cool, that's cool. My dad is 95. Uh, one of his favorite sayings is the best thing about the good old days, they're gone. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm pretty jacked up about this. You know, I, I, nobody likes seeing lame cows. Nobody likes seeing metritis. If we're going to change this, I'm excited. I'm excited. So what does this do? What does this mean to you? Well, what it does is this is more value. So now we're, we're adding more information. And this spreads out our animals. Again, today we got net merit dollars. There's huge differences between the best and the worst, right? And we can definitely afford to do embryo transfer. But now I'm adding in more information. Wow, the ones, you know, that, that don't get sick, they're worth more than the ones that get sick a lot. So what's that do to our index? It spreads these heifers out even more. Gives, gives your customers more, even more reason and confidence to say, hey, I'm going to take embryos from these heifers. I'm going to get rid of these heifers. I'm, I don't have time for them. But I'm going, to, I'm going to find a home for, I want more of these. I want more of these. I can pencil this better, okay? That's what we're about. And get used to it, folks. This has changed. This is the big data information age. We are going to keep adding more and more of this information, and it's going to help you uh, differentiate and show the value of your service going forward, okay? That's my good news. There's one thing you should take away from my talk is things are getting better and better for your industry, okay? Big deal to commercial dairy producers. Uh, again, uh, net merit dollars, USDA's estimate of lifetime profitability for commercial dairy, okay? Commercial dairy farm. Uh, Clarify Plus provides more information and bigger differences help ET economics. Again. Uh, I keep coming back to this one, uh, that, that we're gonna push our customers to stay, keep cows longer, and uh, that twinning deal is the real deal. Uh, uh, that really helps your ET economics, and don't forget about it. 